Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Sestak. I am the current PGY2 Oncology Pharmacy Resident at Monument Health Cancer Care Institute. Today I'm going to cover an overview of ICANS and CRS, which are serious adverse effects that can occur with one of our newer emerging class of medications called bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies. I wanted to start by just explaining what ICANS and CRS stand for. So CRS is cytokine release syndrome and ICANS is immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome and we'll get into these a little bit more in depth later in the presentation but I wanted you to understand these abbreviations and what they stood for right off the bat of this presentation. These are both very serious adverse effects that can occur with bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies and they do likely lead to hospitalization so many times when patients do experience these they will end up admitted to the hospital. I also wanted to go through a couple of definitions right away. So those two definitions are T-cell engagers and bispecific antibodies. What a T-cell engager is, is a protein that simultaneously binds an antigen on tumor cells and a surface molecule, which is usually CD3, on T-cells to induce tumor lysis through formation of an immune synapse. And then a bispecific antibody is a T-cell engager that has a recombinant bispecific protein with two linked single fragment variables originating from two individual antibodies. One of those which is targeting a cell surface molecule on those T-cells and the other which is targeting antigens on malignant cell surfaces. So now that we've gone through those definitions a little, that will help you understand the mechanism of these agents, these bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies. They basically work on cancer cells by inducing tumor cell death by forming that immune synapse between the T-cells and tumor cells. So I have the pictures from two different specific bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies here. The picture on the left is Epkinley, so you can see here it is linking the B-cell through the CD20 receptor to the T-cell on the CD3 receptor. They're forming that immune synapse there in the middle and then that is causing release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and cell death. And then the photo on the right is the Tech Bailey specifically working very similarly. It's binding the T cell with the CD3 and then it is binding the multiple myeloma cell with the target for that one being BCMA. It's again forming the immune synapse just to help um, the cell death and help the immune system recognize and destroy those multiple myeloma cells. Next, I'm going to discuss the mechanism of ICANS and CRS that's thought to occur with bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies. Of note, CAR T-cell therapy can also cause ICANS and CRS, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the bispecific T-cell engagers. So how this is thought to happen is through binding of the, the cancer cell to the T-cell it forms that immune synapse and it's thought to overactivate the immune response after that administration of the medication. And then the interaction of the medication with their target on the cells is thought to lead to an activation of the T cell that triggers an in situ cytokine hypersecretion, such as interferon gamma or tumor necrosis factor alpha. And then those further activate the local innate immune response with monocytes, macrophages, TB, natural killer cells, and then non immune response cells to also produce a wide variety of cytokines. And then that leads to a massive cytokine storm occurring and a strong systemic inflammatory response, which in turn can lead to endothelial activation and blood-brain barrier disruption, potentially causing that CRS and ICANS. In the next few slides, I'm going to cover a few of the medications in the bispecific T-cell engaging antibody class that we may use at Monument Health. And I'm also going to cover some data from the CRS and ICANS events and studies. This first slide is the lymphoma medications that we might use. So these are Epkinley, Columbi, and Lonsumio. These all target CD3 and CD20. This next slide shows the multiple myeloma medications that you may see used at Monument Health. These are Tecveli, Elrexfeo, and Talvi. Tecveli and Alrexfeo both target CD3 and BCMA, and Talvi is just a little bit different as it targets CD3 and GPRC5D. 
These agents are a little bit higher risk for CRS and ICANS than the others we discussed previously, and they do have a REMS program that requires it to be followed before administration of these medications. Um, studies are ongoing for both these multiple myeloma medications and these lymphoma medications. Right now, they're towards the later line of treatment, but these studies are still ongoing to see where they truly fall in therapy and they could potentially maybe even be sooner lines in therapy than towards the later end. This is a chart showing the overall CRS and ICANS rates from each of these medications that is known so far. As you can see, Tecvali and Talvi are the two with the highest rates of potential for CRS and ICANS. However, all of these medications, for the most part, have a pretty high chance of CRS and they all do have the potential for causing ICANS as well. These reactions are most likely to occur during cycle one because that's when they'll really be doing their step up doses and getting their first full dose and we'll talk about that dosing here in the next few slides in the future. But really the exact timing is dependent on the specific medication. Now we'll move into discussing the CRS and ICANS data from the main studies with each of the medications. So this first medication we're going to talk about is the Epkinley, and this slide is showing the CRS events. So as you can see, of that 51% of patients that had CRS, it's broken down based on days. So they had day 1, day 8, day 15, and day 22 listed out here. So they show the doses as well that the patient received and the step-up dosing they received. So they started out with a little bit lower doses, and then they got to that first full dose on day 15. So as you can see, really most of the events occurred on day 15 with that first full dose of 48 milligrams for this drug. 61% of those patients that had the CRS event had that happen during day 15. The median time to CRS onset after the first full dose for patients was about 21 hours overall with a range of 0 to 7 days. Um, and then it did end up resolving in 98% of patients and the median duration of CRS events was about two days with a range of one to 27 days. ICANS events with Epkinley also did mainly occur during cycle one with nine out of 10 ICANS events occurring during cycle one. The median time to ICANS onset after starting therapy was 16.5 days with a range though anywhere from eight to 141 days. And then relative to the most recent administration, the median time to onset was about 3 days with a range of 1 to 13 days. And the median duration of ICANS was about 4 days with a range of 0 to 8 days. It did resolve in 90% or 9 out of 10 patients with supportive care. This slide shows some figures for Columbia showing the cytokine release syndrome profile. It shows the incidence of CRS broken down by grade, as well as the median time to CRS onset from the start of infusion and then the median CRS duration. As you can see looking at the incidence of CRS, it was mainly grade 1 and grade 2 with Columbia that did occur. And then the median time to CRS onset from the start of infusion varied depending on what dose they were getting. The median ranged anywhere from 14 to 29 hours and then each median time had their own range listed below as well. And then the median CRS duration was also dependent on the dose the patients were receiving, but the median did range anywhere from 14 to 30 hours with ranges for each specific dose listed below those median times as well. This next figure further breaks down the cytokine release syndrome with Columbia by cycle. So it has it broken down between grades per cycle and dose that the patients were receiving. So as you can see, most of these events did occur during cycle one and cycle two, and then cycles three and on, there were very few events. Here's another figure for Columbia showing the CRS rates by cycle broken down by grade for patients who receive dexamethasone premedication. So as you can see, most of these events still did occur in cycle one, but with this, the information that they show is that on cycles three and on, if they received that dexamethasone before their doses, they didn't have any CRS that they saw. 
In regards to ICANS events with Columbia, ICANS of any grade did occur in seven patients, which was 4.8% of the patients, and then grade three or higher ICANS events occurred in just two patients or 1.4% of the population. The next medication that we're going to talk about CRS events for is Linsumio. 39% of patients experienced CRS in the trial who received the recommended dose and then the grades specifically broken down are listed below. As you can see, most of these patients were also in the grade one or grade two. Recurrent CRS did occur in 11% of patients and most patients experienced CRS after doses of one milligram on cycle one day one with that being 15% of patients and then two milligrams on cycle one day eight that being 5% of patients and then lastly 60 milligrams on cycle one day 15 that being 33% of patients. 5% of patients did experience CRS after a 60 milligram dose on cycle two day one, and then 1% of patients experienced CRS following subsequent doses after that. For Linsumio CRS events, the median time to onset of CRS from the start of administration was again dependent on which cycle and which day the patients were on. So it is listed below as cycle one, day one, cycle one, day eight, cycle one, day 15, and cycle two, day one. It shows the median time to onset for each of those, as well as the range for each of those. And then the median duration of CRS was about three days with a range of one to 29 days. For Linsumio ICANS was reported in 1% of patients that received the Linsumio in the trial at the recommended dose, with those just being grade 1 and grade 2, grade 1 and grade 2 each having 0.5% of the patients. Next, we're going to transition into talking about CRS events with Tech Bailey. In the clinical trial, about 72% of patients experienced CRS, and that's further broken down into grades 1, 2, and 3 below. As you can see, most patients that had CRS were grade 1 or grade 2, and then most patients experienced CRS following step-up dose 1, step-up dose 2, or the initial treatment dose. Recurrent CRS did happen in 33% of patients, and the median time to onset of CRS was about two days, with a range of one to six days after the most recent dose. Lastly, the median duration of CRS was two days, with a range of one to nine days. In regards to ICANS for Tech Bailey, 6% of patients experienced ICANS in the clinical trial. Most of these patients experienced ICANS following their first or second step-up doses or their initial treatment dose. Less than 3% of patients developed a first occurrence of ICANS with subsequent doses, and the median time to onset of ICANS was 4 days with a range of 2 to 8 days after their most recent dose. Lastly, the median ICANS duration for Tech Valley was about 3 days with a range of 1 to 20 days. Next, we are going to talk about LREXVO CRS events. So in a clinical trial, CRS occurred in 58% of patients receiving LREXVO at the recommended dose. The grades are listed below again, grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3, with most events being grade 1 overall and also grade 2. CRS recurred in about 13% of patients, and most patients experienced CRS after the first step-up dose or the second step of dose. 7% of patients did experience CRS after the first treatment dose and 1.6% of patients experienced CRS after a subsequent dose. The median time to onset of CRS was two days with a range of one to nine days after the most recent dose and the median CRS duration was two days with a range of one to 19 days. ICANS occurred in 3.3% of patients who received LREXVO at the recommended dose in the clinical trial. Most patients had ICANS after the first step-up dose, but one patient did have ICANS after the second step-up dose, and one patient did have ICANS after subsequent doses. Recurrent ICANS occurred in 1.1% of patients, and the median time to ICANS onset was about 3 days, with a range of 1 to 4 days after the most recent dose. The median ICANS duration was about two days with a range of one to 18 days. The last medication that I'm going to go through in regards to CRS and ICANS events is Talvi. 
So in a clinical trial, CRS occurred in 76% of patients receiving Talvi at the recommended dose. The CRS percentages are listed below for each grade 1 through 3. As you can see, these were mainly grade 1 and 2 events again. And then recurrent CRS occurred in 30% of patients. Most events occurred after step up dose 1 or step up dose 2 at the recommended dosages. It also occurred in 33% of patients with step up dose 3 in the bi weekly dosing schedule, in 30% of patients with the first 0.4 milligram per kilogram treatment dose, and in 12 of the patients treated with the first 0.8 milligram per kilogram treatment dose. The combined CRS rate for both dosing schedules was less than 3% for each of the remaining doses in cycle 1 and less than 3% cumulatively from cycle 2 onward. The median time of CRS onset was 27 hours with a range of 0.1 to 167 hours from the last dose, and then the median CRS duration was 17 hours with a range of 0 to 622 hours. In regards to ICANS events for Talvi, in a clinical trial, ICANS occurred in 9% of patients receiving Talvi at the recommended dose. Most patients had ICANS following step up dose 1 or 2, and then step up dose 3 of the bi weekly dosing schedule the initial treatment dose of the weekly dosing schedule or the bi-weekly dosing schedule. Recurrent ICANS occurred in 3% of patients and the median time to ICANS onset was 2.5 days with a range of 1 to 16 days after the most recent dose. Lastly, the median ICANS duration was about 2 days with a range of 1 to 22 days. So because of the risk of CRS and neurologic toxicity, including ICANS, specifically Tecvali, Talvi, and Arixfeel require enrollment in a REMS program like mentioned before. So the website links and the websites are shown in the photos here. The one on the left is specifically for Tecvali and Talvi, and then the one on the right is for Arixfeel. Basically, to prescribe these medications, providers just must follow the rules to become certified and talk to the patients about the risks of these adverse effects, as well as providing the patient with some instruction and wallet card after the counseling is complete. And then to dispense these medications, healthcare settings have to have an authorized representative that's in charge of everything for these, and then they have to train staff to become compliant with these REMS requirements as well as obtaining an authorization to dispense each of the infusions by logging into the websites. And then at Monument Health, we do document the code for the authorization that we, we receive in the order, so we have that there. And then we're not able to transfer or loan or sell any of our products and have to maintain records to demonstrate all the processes and procedures in place are being followed in case we can show those during an audit. We do have some preventative measures we can take to prevent ICANS and CRS from potentially occurring, as well as precautionary measures we have in place in case CRS and ICANS does occur. One of the preventative measures that's big is using step-up dosing as we've discussed. So as you can see on the right, I have a couple examples of the step-up dosing schedules. I have Tech Valley and Epkinley listed. They typically start at a lower dose and then increase up to what the would like the patient to receive as a full dose and then they change frequency of the doses in most of them as well. Another preventative measure is using pre-medication such as corticosteroids, histamine, antagonists, and antipyretics, especially during the first cycle when these reactions are most common. Common pre-meds that are used are Benadryl, acetaminophen, and dexamethasone. Hospitalization periods are also typically required. The length of the hospitalization after injections is just dependent on the medication. This is usually done after the first full dose and during the step-up doses when that risk of CRS and ICANS is the highest. Another thing with regards to dosing for prevention and precaution is that if a patient does miss a dose for too long, typically we do have to retitrate them back up dependent on the medication and how many days they miss the dose for. Next, we're going to cover how we identify CRS. So the main things we look at to see if a patient may have CRS are if they have a fever, if they're hypotensive, or if they have hypoxia. A fever is defined as a temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or more, and then hypotension is usually defined as a systolic blood pressure 
of less than 90 or less than 75% of a patient's baseline. This should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, though accounting for age and a patient's baseline blood pressure, as everyone is different. And then lastly, hypoxia is defined as a patient requiring oxygen to maintain oxygen saturation above 90%. So if a patient does have any of these or a multiple of these, they may have CRS. If a patient has any of those signs of CRS, it's important to grade them to see what we may do next for treatment. The American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy does have a grading for CRS, and that is listed here. This is graded grade 1 through grade 4. Grade 1 is a temperature of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Grade 2 is that temperature with hypotension that's responsive to fluids and doesn't require vasopressors and or oxygen requirement of low flow nasal cannula or blow by. Grade 3 is then a temperature with that 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or more with hypotension requiring one vasopressor with or without vasopressin and or oxygen requirement of high flow nasal cannula, face mask, non-rebreather mask, or venturi mask. Lastly, our worst grade or grade 4 is that temperature with hypotension requiring multiple vasopressors excluding vasopressin and or oxygen requirement of positive pressure. There are a few caveats I wanted to point out when grading CRS. One thing is that the grade should be determined at least two times a day and whenever there is a change in status of the patient. Also, a fever could be masked by any antipyretics or anti-cytokine therapy that's been given. So for patients with CRS who received an antipyretic or anti-cytokine therapy, such as tocilizumab or steroids, a fever is no longer required to grade subsequent CRS severity. In that case, we just grade it using hypotension and or hypoxia. And then lastly, oxygen provided as a comfort measure only should not be used to determine a CRS grade. This is a general overview of CRS management, and this is overall the protocol we would follow for the most part at Monument Health. The first thing we would want to do is grade the patient as discussed previously, and then based on the grade, we would decide whether we want to start with dexamethasone or we would go straight to starting with tocilizumab. If they're grade 1, we can start with one dose of dexamethasone, 10 milligrams, and then if they don't improve in four hours, we can give them a dose of tocilizumab. If they would not improve in 8 hours after that dose, then we can move to what we would do for grades 2 through 4 as well, which is starting with tocilizumab IV and repeating that every 8 hours up to 3 total doses. We also could add dexamethasone 10 to 20 mg by mouth or IV every 6 hours. And then if there is progressive symptoms after the second dose of tocilizumab, we maybe could consider an alternative cytokine blockade. Lastly, another option is to give methylprednisolone 1,000 to 2,000 mg IV daily for three days and to taper that over two to three days as tolerated. Additional caveats with this are that we would want to contact a hematology oncology provider for any CRS grade that would occur. We also want to make sure we admit the patient for CRS of any grade if they are outpatient. And we want to assess the patient for infections and provide supportive care as needed. And then we lastly want to just make sure we monitor cardiac, renal, and hepatic functions as needed. Now I wanted to talk just a little bit more in depth about tocilizumab. This medication's mechanism of action is that it is an antagonist of the interleukin-6 receptor. And through that inhibition of interleukin-6 receptors, it leads to a reduction in cytokine and acute phase reactant production which is how it would help with CRS. The adult dose of this medication is 8 mg per kilogram with a maximum dose of 800 mg per dose. The administration of this medication is that it is given IV infusion over 60 minutes and the interval though between any repeat doses should be at least 8 hours. It's generally very well tolerated with minimal adverse effects, but it does have a boxed warning for risk of serious infections, which makes sense that is, it is an antagonist at that interleukin-6 receptor, so it could increase infection risk. This medication was approved in 2017 for treatment of patients two years of age and older for CRS occurring with CAR T-cell therapy. 
use with CRS from bispecific T-cell engaging therapy is actually off-label, but there are case reports that have shown that supportive care with the tocilizumab and corticosteroids is efficacious. I also wanted to include this photo here that's a visual representation of the current and potential therapeutic interventions for CRS. This is specifically showing for CAR T-cell therapy, but it's very similar for our bispecific T-cell engaging antibodies as well. So I wanted to show you this so you could see a visual representation of how that tocilizumab particularly works. We also have another medication called anakinra that's sometimes more used in the neurotoxicity setting and blocks IL-1. Now that we've concluded our discussion of CRS, I wanted to go into discussing how to identify ICANs. So because this is a neurotoxicity, really if any of the following neurological type symptoms are present, the patient could have ICANs, those being aphasia, altered consciousness level, impaired cognitive skills, motor weakness, seizures, cerebral edema, tremors, and changes in handwriting. On the right, I have an example of what a patient's changes in handwriting may look like if they do have ICANs. Similarly to grading CRS for treatment, we must also grade ICANs. So the ICANs grade is determined by the most severe event, not attributable to another cause. To grade these, we look at the immune effector cell associated encephalopathy score, the ICE score, their level of consciousness, whether they've had a seizure, their motor findings, and then if they have increased intracranial pressure or cerebral edema. Listed here is the ICE assessment tool and scoring for grading of ICANs. One thing we look at for this is their orientation, and that is worth four points. We also look at their ability to name objects, which is worth three points. We look at whether they're able to follow commands, and that is worth one point. And then we look at their ability to write a standard sentence, which is also worth one point. Lastly, we look at their attention, or for example, their ability to count backwards from 100 by 10, which is also worth one point. For the ICE assessment tool and scoring, after we have scored the patient using the items on the previous slide, we can add those numbers together to determine the grade of ICANs that they do have. So if they have a score of 10, they have no impairment. If they have a score of 7 to 9, that is grade 1 ICANs. Grade 2 ICANs would be defined as a score of 3 to 6. And then grade 3 ICANs would be a score of 0 to 2. If a patient has an ICE score of 0, they could be classified as having grade 3 ICANs if they're awake. And then lastly, our worst grade, grade 4, would be a score of 0 due to the patient being unarousable and unable to perform the ICE assessment. Another consideration for grading of ICANs is if they have a depressed level of consciousness that isn't attributable to other causes. Grade 1 would be if they're able to awaken spontaneously. Grade 2 in regards to this would be if they awaken to voice. Grade 3 would be if they're awakening only to tactile stimulus. And then lastly, grade 4 would be if the patient is unarousable or is requiring vigorous and repetitive tactile stimuli to arouse them or if they're in stupor or coma. As mentioned, other considerations for grading of ICANs is whether they've had a seizure and certain motor findings. So if they've had a seizure of any kind, it would be classified as either grade 3 or grade 4, dependent on the severity of the seizure and type of seizure. So grade 3 would be any clinical seizure, focal or generalized, that resolved rapidly, or non-convulsive seizures on an electric encephalogram that uh, resolve with intervention and then grade four would be a life-threatening or prolonged seizure that's more than five minutes or repetitive clinical electrical seizures without return to baseline in between. If they did have deep focal motor weakness such as hemiparesis or periparesis that would be the only time we would look at a motor finding and that would just be classified as grade four. The last consideration when grading ICANs would be whether they have raised intracranial pressure or cerebral edema. Again, if they have either of these, they're going to be grade 3 or 4. Grade 3 would be if they just have focal or local edema on neuroimaging, and grade 4 would be if they have diffuse cerebral edema on neuroimaging or any of the other listed things here. 
Here is another figure showing the general overview of ICANN's management, and this is also the general overview for a protocol that we follow at Monument Health for this ICANN's management. First, we start with, again, grading it similarly to CRS, so we'll decide whether it's grade 1 or grades 2 through 4. For grade 1, we can start at the top with giving dexamethasone 10 to 20 milligrams orally or IV daily, and then we'll assess if they've had symptom improvement. If they have, we can de-escalate and taper the steroids quickly for symptoms of grade 1 or less that aren't impacting daily living or patient safety. And if they have not improved, then we would give dexamethasone 10 to 20 milligrams by mouth or IV every six hours. After that, we would again assess for symptom improvement, and if they have improved, we can de-escalate and taper the steroids. But if they have not improved, then we would go to our treatment for grades 2 through 4, which would be methylprednisolone 2 milligram per kilogram or 1,000 to 2,000 milligram IV daily. Some additional caveats we would take into consideration again would be that we would contact a hematology oncology provider for any ICANS grade. We would also use that ICE assessment tool and scoring to determine grade along with those other additional things we discussed determining the grade as well. And then we would consider Keppra addition for seizure prophylaxis and ensure that we admit the patient with ICANS of any grade and consider a neurology consult. There are also other agents we could consider, such as anakinra, if there's no improvement with steroids, and we could consider tocilizumab if the patient also has CRS, but the tocilizumab itself would not help with the ICANS neurotoxicity-associated symptoms. Here is a list of my references for this presentation. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions I may be able to address.